The great thing about modern monetary theory is that it is based on a realistic description of the monetary system and how it actually works. Every time historically the monetary policy has taken the lead, it has been associated with asset price bubbles, private indebtedness and rising inequality. And when we have had an approach to macroeconomics, which has been based on something similar to functional finance or an MMT perspective, we've had full employment and economies have grown, but we've had, we've avoided those big financial crises. We've avoided the asset price bubbles. We've kept a lid on the behaviour of private financial institutions and we've seen more equality. This is the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Hi, I'm Christian Riley, and welcome to the Modern Monetary Theory Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at MMT Podcast, and you can support the show by going to patreon.com slash MMT Podcast. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get early access to all our episodes and patron-only episodes. A big thank you to all our supporters so far. At the beginning there, you heard my guest this week, Dr. Stephen Hale, on the importance of understanding how our financial system works in reality rather than folklore. If you're a policymaker, or more importantly, an electorate who wants to pressure policymakers to change the economy to one that works for everyone, you need to know what to want. And that's why we do this podcast. If you know a bit about MMT, you know that the taxes you pay to central government don't fund government spending. And they can't fund government spending. The point of having a fiat currency is just that. When your government spends pounds or dollars or yen on things, it is spending new currency into existence by instructing its central bank to change the balance on the relevant bank accounts upward using a computer keyboard. And when you pay taxes to central government, the numbers are changed in the opposite direction again using keystrokes. You can listen to our previous episodes if you need catching up on this. And I'd say our first three episodes or episode 20 with MMT founder Warren Mosler are a good crash course. So if governments create money when they spend, why do they sell government bonds? Aren't they borrowing money from people and institutions when they do that? Why would they borrow money that they create? Good question. First of all, when it comes to governments that create their own currency, monetarily sovereign governments, the money to buy bonds could only have come from the government in the first place. So what is the bond market all about? What's a yield curve? Why does it matter? Does it even matter? That's what these next two episodes will answer. So just a couple of things. In the interview, I mentioned a recent piece by Professor Bill Mitchell called Inverted Yield Curves signaling a total failure of the dominant mainstream macroeconomics, which I'll link to in the show notes. And I also mention market strategist Kevin Muir, who we'll be interviewing soon, and I've linked to his MMT writing as well. On a personal note, I'd like to say thanks as ever to Dr. Hale, who really makes huge efforts to help me and hopefully you guys listening understand things. And he does so for many other people all day long. So thanks, Stephen. Let's dive in. Hi, Stephen Hale. Welcome back to the MMT podcast. Thanks for coming back. Well, thanks for asking me back, Christian. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm good. I'm good. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you about, because you're so good at explaining these things, is the news this week or end of last week was that the yield curve for the US Treasury securities has inverted. And I wanted you to explain what that means to an absolute beginner. The yield curve describes the relationship between short and long-term interest rates. And when we say interest rates there, I mean what we would sometimes call default risk-free interest rates. So it's the rate of interest that the federal government is paying on its debt. And actually, there are many countries around the world with uh, inverted yield curves at some maturities, which means 
Well, for example, in Australia, I think at the moment the two-year interest rate is below the one-year interest rate. So if you invest in uh, government bonds in Australia, which have two years to run at the moment, then you'd be getting a lower return if you held them for two years than you'd be getting if you invested in uh, one-year government bonds at the moment. That's unusual. It's normally the other way around. Usually, the longer the time you tie your money up for, the higher the interest rate you get. Now, in the case of the US, um, I, I, I think in the case of Britain, the yield curve is inverted out to about five years. That means five-year interest rates in the UK are lower than, well, they're not just lower than one-year uh, government bond rates in the UK. They're lower than the bank rate. Um, the, the official interest rate, uh, then the yield curve, I think, uh, becomes normal or upward sloping. So 10-year interest rates in Britain are above five-year rates at the moment. Um, in the case of the US, the yield curve is inverted all the way out to 10 years, which means yeah. the longer the time you invest your money for, the lower the interest rate you're getting. We tend to talk about the difference between the two-year interest rate and the 30-year interest rate. Is it that they tend to, from my reading, that seems to be the significant um, thing. Normally, we compare two-year and 10-year. Uh, in the case of most countries, it's only relatively recently that there have been significant government bond issues for as long as 30 years. And in the case of Australia, for example... I think there might be some 30-year bonds now, but that would be the extreme case, and they didn't used to be. Um, so because there aren't many really long-dated bonds like that, we tend to you tend to compare either the 10-year interest rate with the two-year one, or sometimes you compare the 10-year interest rate with uh, the official interest rate, the overnight rate that we've spoken about before, what they call the bank rate in the UK or the cash rate in Australia. But it doesn't really matter. I mean, if long-term interest rates are below short-term interest rates, we say the yield curve is inverted because normally, historically, it's been the other way around. Long-term rates have been above short-term rates. There is a technical reason for that, which perhaps is not worth worrying about. It's more or less right to say that when you buy longer term government bonds, you're tying your money up for longer. And so you normally get a premium in order to compensate for that. Might be a one or one and a half percent difference on average between a 10 year uh, uh, government bond interest rate and a, and a one year one, let's say what we call the slope of the yield curve. The difference between long-term and short-term interest rates varies over time, and it's, um, it's influenced by what investors expect to happen to short-term interest rates in the future. So when you get an inverted yield curve, what that means is that um, investors are anticipating that official interest rates in the UK, the bank rate, will be lower than it is at the moment over quite a long period of time on average. That's what, um, uh, that's how we usually make sense of an inverted yield curve. Now, why would you expect the bank rate to be lower than it is now and to remain low for a long time. You'd normally expect that when nobody's worried about inflation and when everybody's worried about a weak economy. So that's why an inverted yield curve is often seen as a sign of, uh, of impending recession because um, when economies have gone towards recession in the past, central banks have cut interest rates and held them at lower rates for a long, long period of time. And when investors expect those official interest rates, short term interest rates in the economy to be lower in the future, it makes it more attractive for them to tie their money up long term at a fixed interest rate now. So it makes longer term bonds more attractive to buy and that puts upward pressure on the prices of those longer term bonds, which is the same thing as saying that uh, investors will be prepared to hold those longer term bonds, even though they're offering a lower 
rate of interest than they were before. What I'd like to do is unpack some of these terms now. Let's back up to what is a treasury security for the layperson? Well, um, there are things called treasury bills in the UK and they're called treasury notes in Australia, which are predominantly held, well, almost exclusively held by financial institutions. They're very short-term government debt. In the UK, treasury bills are issued for one month or three months or six months uh, by the UK government. And for investors who are looking for very short term, very liquid, very safe assets that, <coughs> that give a good return, they might want to hold treasury bills in their investment portfolio. And uh, Government debt, which is issued for uh, more than a year, and we might be talking about 30 years or even more than 30 years these days, uh, we don't call treasury bills, we call treasury bonds or government bonds. And government bonds, if you buy them, uh, well, we can almost, we can arbitrarily assign a, a, a face value or par value because uh, actually people can, I mean, it, this doesn't mean you're buying them in units of $100 or anything. In fact, Institutional investors trade them in in uh, multiples of a, of a million. Sorry, not dollars, uh, pounds usually. But um, let's say we talk about a government bond as having a face value or par value of a hundred pounds. Now, if that bond, let's say, is originally issued for ten years, let's say it's a ten-year bond when it's issued. Um, if you invest in that bond and you hold it until maturity. If it's just a normal bond rather than an index linked one, then in 10 years time, you'll get your £100 back again. But meantime, uh, twice a year, every six months, you'll get some interest from the Treasury as well. The amount of interest that you get is determined by something which is called the coupon rate of interest. And the coupon rate of interest is fixed across the life of the bond. So let's say... Um, it wouldn't be such a high figure these days, but a few years ago, let's say the coupon rate of interest is 5%. Then for every £100 worth of par value of bond, you'd get £5 of interest from the government a year. But you'd get that every six months. So you'd get £2.50 every six months while you owned the bond. And then, as I said, if the bond only lasts for 10 years, if it has a maturity of 10 years, in 10 years' time, uh, as well as getting the final £2.50 of interest back, you'd get the £100 back that you paid for the bond in the first place. So bonds have a par value and they have a coupon rate of interest. And those are, for, for the standard bonds, those are fixed across the life of the bond. They don't change. However... And this is where people get confused. And I got a grumpy email only today or yesterday <laughs> from uh, someone in the UK uh, about uh, 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 me having confused them. Um, the coupon rate of interest on a bond, which is fixed, is not the same thing as the market rate of interest or the sometimes it's called the yield on a bond. This is because... The price of a bond will not stay equal to its par value over time. It will go up and down depending on uh, demand and supply in the bond market, depending on investors' uh, decisions. And basically, if you have to pay a higher price, if you have to pay more than £100 to get that £5 of interest a year from the UK government on that bond I was just talking about, then the market rate of interest on the bond or the yield, the return you're getting on every pound you've invested in the bond, will be less than 5% because you're getting £5 a year back, but you're paying more than £100 in order to get that £5 back. Uh, on the other hand, if the price of the bond, if you could buy that bond for less than £100, then for every pound you invested in the bond, you'd be getting more than 5% per annum back. Now, the prices of bonds and the market rate of interest or yield on bonds change over time as a result of changes in financial, uh, in financial markets. And as I said, they go in opposite directions. So, uh, well, let me put it this way. 
Uh, suppose you've bought bonds issued by the Greek government, and as we know, there's default risk associated with them because Greece doesn't issue its own currency and can run out of euros. And let's say Greece has had a terrible credit rating from the credit rating agencies and you take them seriously and so do other investors. Uh, and so um, people that own Greek government bonds want to sell them and investors are less keen to buy them. Well, the prices of those bonds will go down if everybody's trying to sell them and nobody wants to buy them. If there are more sellers than, than buyers at the moment, the, the, the prices of those bonds will go down because they're difficult to sell. Um, that's the same thing as saying that the market rate of interest or the promised yield on those bonds, if the Greek government doesn't default on them, has gone up. Because they're cheaper to buy, they still promise you the same amount of cash coming back if you hold them to maturity, assuming that the government doesn't default. So because you're paying less for them if you buy them on the market, then for every, in this case, euro that you're paying for those bonds, um, you'll get a higher uh, return. So there's that inverse relationship. And the thing is that government bonds in the UK and virtually everywhere else are mainly issued when they are issued initially to institute, mainly to institutional investors. Uh, they're issued via auction mainly, which means that all Although the UK government might, in our story, be issuing that bond that I was just talking about with a 5% coupon rate of interest that for every £100 worth of par pays you £5 of interest a year, although those bonds have that £100 par value, even when they're initially sold, the price at which they are sold um, may not be £100. It could be above £100 or below £100 because they're being auctioned. So it depends on basically how much the big banks and other institutional investors are prepared to pay for them. Uh, if, the, if the bonds are sold at a price which is above that par value of £100, then the rate of interest that the government is paying is actually below the coupon rate on the bond. On the other hand, if investors don't want to buy the bond or are not so keen to buy the bond and they bid for the bond prices, which means that the bond is sold for a price below its par value, then the market rate of interest the government pays on the bond is above that fixed coupon rate. I'm sorry that it's that complicated, but that's that's about as uh, these things are unnecessarily complicated <laughs> very often. And this is an example of that. They usually try, it, it, with most bonds, not all bonds, but most bonds, they try to sell them more or less at par, which means they choose a coupon rate of interest on the bond, which is close to the market rate of interest uh, when the bond is initially offered for sale on the pri what we call the primary market. That's not always the case, but that's usually the case. But then over time, of course, as we know, in recent years, interest rates can go up or, or, or in recent years they can go down quite a lot. And as the market rate of interest on government bonds goes down, that's the same thing as saying that the prices of those bonds go up over time. So we have the market rate of interest on a bond, which is the return you'll get if you buy the bond at its market price today and you hold it until it matures. And that will depend on whatever the price of the bond is today and will vary over time because bond prices vary or market interest rates vary. Uh, and we have the coupon rate of interest on the bond, which is fixed when the bond is issued and stays constant across the life of the bond. Now, when people are talking about the yield curve, they're talking about the market rate of interest or the yield on, in the case of the UK, on UK government bonds. Great. That was that was really clear. Bill Mitchell put out a, re a blog post about bond economics in the last couple of days. And the way he described it was... Uh, he used a thousand pound bond and, and he's, you know, it pays out 50 pounds every year. Um, and then to describe the difference between, uh, the coupon rate and the yield, he said, uh, it's a, say it's a 5% coupon rate 
but the market uh the market decides it needs a six percent yield uh, uh or it, it uh, the the five five percent's not worth it it, it desires a uh, a six percent return then it bids the market bids for a lower price uh, a lower uh, par value at the auction in order to make up the difference Does, have i got that um right? yeah I, I i think so i think so uh, more i could maybe make it a bit simpler in that we yeah. could imagine that let's say we're talking about a bond that has only one year to run uh, and let's say that the interest payment on the bond unlike real life government bonds isn't once every six months it's once a year so actually there's only going to be one interest payment left now this could be a bond which is just being issued but only for a year or more likely we're talking about a bond that already exists and has a year to run let's say we took we're taking let's uh, actually we more often talk about par values in terms of thousands of pounds or dollars than hundreds i used a hundred because people find percentages easier uh, when you're talking about a hundred but let's go let's go for a, a thousand this bond has a par value of $1,000, and let's say it has a coupon rate of interest of 10%. Now, 10% is 10 of 1,000 is 100. So if you, if you own this bond, or if you buy the bond now, it's got a, years to, a year to run, this means in a year's time, you're going to receive $1,100 from the government. The $1,000 is the repayment of the par value of the bond, sometimes called the face value of the bond, and the other $100 is that coupon interest payment, which is fixed. Now, if you could buy this bond now for its par value, it's got a year to run, if you could buy it now for its par value, in other words, if you could buy the bond for £1,000 now, you're going to get £1,100 back in a year's time, you'd be getting a 10% return on your money. So there'd be a 10% uh, yield you'd be getting. Another name for the yield on a bond is the market rate of interest. And I'm sorry for the person in England this annoys, but on the bond market, we use the term yield to maturity or market rate of interest synonymously. They mean the same thing. It's the return that the market is looking for on the bond. If you could buy the bond at its par value, then the market rate of interest or yield and the coupon rate would be the same thing. Let's say that there'd been such demand for this bond that if you bought the bond today, you couldn't buy it for its par value. It's uh, the, the, There's been upward pressure on the price of the bond because of everybody wanting to buy this safe asset because everybody's scared of holding more risky assets. So suppose the price of the bond today is not a thousand pounds it's eleven hundred pounds what does that mean you're paying eleven hundred pounds today for this bond which in a year's time will give you eleven hundred pounds back from the government in that case there would be a zero market rate of interest or a zero yield on the bond so if the price of this bond goes above its par value then the market rate of interest or the yield that the investor gets who buys the bond goes down. And as we've just said, if the price goes up far enough, then the market rate of interest or yield on the bond, and this is true of a lot of government bonds around the world at the moment, will end up being zero because the price you pay for that bond now is just what you're going to get back when the bond matures, no more than that. On the other hand, of course, if you could buy the bond for less than £100 now, then the bond would promise you a greater than 10% return on your money. And this is kind of what Bill was talking about, sort of. If investors are less keen to buy this bond, they require a high return. And requiring a high return on a bond where the bond, by definition, pays you a fixed amount of cash, that doesn't change. The way you get a higher return if, if, you on the, if investors on the market generally require a higher return in order to lend their money to this government than they did before is they pay less for the bond in the first place. In which case, if you bought the bond for, let's say, uh, 900, 950, 
um, uh, 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 pounds instead of a thousand pounds, then when you hold the bond to maturity, sure, you're getting that 100 pounds payment, that 10% coupon payment, but you're also getting a capital gain because the price you paid for the bond a year ago is less than the par value of the bond that the government gives you back when it matures. So you get the interest payment and you get a bit more, sort of. Of course, the government, or I should say the central bank, is in a position, if they want to, to determine the location of the entire yield curve. Well, the Bank of Japan has, uh, for the last three years, set the market rate of interest or yield on Japanese government bonds with 10 years to maturity at approximately zero. And the way they have done that is they have just bought enough government bonds until basically, well, it wasn't a one-year bonds. We're not talking one-year bonds. We're talking 10-year bonds now. But if, if that, remember that example I just gave with bonds, those bonds with one year to run that are going to pay £1,100 in a year's time if the Bank of England was just to keep buying them until the price had been driven up to £1,100 now, there'd be a zero market rate of interest on them. So the Japanese government just buys whatever, sorry, the Japanese central bank just buys whatever amount of Japanese government bonds is necessary every month in order to hold the um, yield or the market rate of interest on, the, on those 10-year bonds at zero. Now, they could... And do that right the way across the yield curve if they wanted to. So the way that it's done in most countries at the moment, um, we don't have central banks elsewhere that are uh, deliberately using quantitative easing to fix a long-term interest rate on, on government debt like that. So in most countries at the moment, the shape of the yield curve depends on what investors expect the central bank to do on average to the official interest rate in the UK, the bank rate. But what the Bank of Japan has shown is that if central banks wanted to, they could trade at all maturities on the bond market, buying and selling bonds. Um, to to the extent that was necessary to well to deliver whatever interest rate they wanted to if they wanted a zero percent market rate of interest on government bonds right the way across the yield curve then central banks could uh, could trade they could use their balance sheets to deliver it so just jump in a second there a few beats ago you said um but when you talked about a person in the market or an institution buying a bond you said uh, borrowing money from the buyer of the bond it's the government borrowing money now in mmt that's problematic isn't it in mmt i said that about i think i said that probably in the context of greece Ah, right okay yeah uh, it depends what you mean by greece definitely is borrowing money yeah for sure uh, yeah. in the case of whether you want to talk about the uk borrowing money is well, it's up to you really they're not borrowing it because they need it um historically in the uk and this is still the case in australia as we know, uh, the issuance of government bonds has been about draining reserves from the banking system to assist the central bank, the Reserve Bank of Australia or the Bank of England in its management of short term interest rates. Because when the government spends more than it raises in taxes, that puts additional reserves into the banking system. And if you don't withdraw those reserves from the banking system, then that puts downward pressure on the rate of interest at which the private banks lend to each other short term and where that is the policy interest rate that can push that interest rate below the central bank's target for that interest rate. Now, this is no longer valid in places where there's been large scale quantitative easing, as I mentioned to you in a previous podcast, like the UK, because British banks are stuffed full of reserves and do not need to lend to each other overnight in the same way that they used to do. So the, uh, the bank rate in the UK is the interest rate that the Bank of England pays on, on those reserves that private banks hold at the Bank of England anyway. So if you want a reason for the British government to issue bonds at all, really you're stuck with uh, offering fund managers, offering financial institutions a safe interest-bearing asset for those institutions to hold, what uh, Bill calls uh, somewhat 
provocatively, perhaps uh, uh, welfare to savers or welfare yeah. to investors. There's, there's no other reason for doing it. And uh, yeah. where I very much agree with Bill is that actually government bond issuance is uh, an anachronism. There's no, you don't, we don't need to do it anymore. There's, there's no reason why we should have official interest rate at zero and default risk-free uh -huh. interest rates right the way across the whole yield curve at zero, if that's what you want to do. If you want to have longer term interest rates, which are non-zero, you just need to offer those wholesale investors savings accounts at the central bank and pay interest on those. Yeah. So, so let's just back up a second. So when we talk about selling bonds as a reserve drain, what we mean is we're shifting the pounds from the reserve account of that institution uh, to the securities account or the guilt account in the UK. What, what's it called in the UK? Securities account? Yeah, you can use that jargon if you like. You may as well just say you're just destroying the reserves. That's what you're doing. Just like taxes destroy reserves they are getting written down in another column though aren't they at the central bank well so do taxes when we pay our taxes there's an accounting record of that at the bank of england too it, yeah. it's uh, but as far as what is sometimes called the monetary base is concerned which includes uh, bank reserves at the central bank as well as currency that's in circulation then uh, bond issuance as with taxes decreases the monetary base. The difference between bond issuance and taxes is that bond issuance does not decrease the net financial assets of the private sector because with bond issuance you are swapping government bonds, which are interest-bearing liabilities of the government, for reserves at the central bank, which are also, broadly speaking, interest-bearing liabilities of the, of the central government. It's an asset swap. When you issue bonds, just like it's an asset swap, when the Bank of England buys those bonds on the secondary market and puts the reserves back into the banking system when they're doing quantitative easing. But, mm -hmm. um, but it, it's fair enough to say, yes, government bond issuance um, decreases the monetary base, reduces bank reserves. And the reason that has often been given in the past and that we still give for issuing government bonds is that uh, um, in a non quantitative easing environment when the um, central bank is trying to fine tune the supply of reserves to the banking system just to meet the demand uh, for reserves from the banking system and to give the banks an incentive to lend to each other at an interest rate of the central bank's choosing at a target interest rate, then deficit spending puts more reserves into the system, puts downward pressure on that interest rate. And if the central bank wants to maintain that interest rate, then either the central bank or in the modern day, the treasury, the government yeah. has to um, make net sales of government securities in order to absorb those excess reserves from the banking system. It still yes, works so. that way in Australia. There's no justification on that basis in the UK, though, because of QA. Uh, so we should just hammer that home that that um, the it's the case that left to its own devices, the interest rate would fall to zero and the government intervenes to put up the interest rate. I'm right, am I right? Left to its own devices, the interest rate would fall to whatever interest rate the central bank pays on private bank reserves. Yes. If the central bank paid no interest on private bank reserves, then the the money market interest rate, the short-term interbank interest rate, would fall to zero. Yes. That's what people like Bill mean when they say the natural rate of interest is zero. Let's just uh, talk about the terms to do with bonds. So. We've talked about the face value, which you've called the par value, yeah. uh, and that's your here's a thousand pound bond. Uh, the uh, uh, the coupon rate is the five percent or ten percent, whatever you get uh, every year as a percentage of that par value. There are complicated things called uh, index bond, index linked bonds, but with standard bonds, the par value is fixed across the life of the bond and will never change. And the coupon rate of interest is fixed across the life of the bond and will never change. 
and the yield is something that the yield or the market rate of interest on a bond you could say depends on the price you pay for that bond yeah if you if you can buy a bond for a price which is below its par value if you then held the bond to maturity just think of it like this it, it's it's a little slightly more complicated than this if there are any you know financial mathematicians listening they'll feel a bit sick because i'm i'm not explaining it uh, precisely accurately but this is a nice way of remembering it if you can buy the bond for a price which is below its par value and you hold it to maturity the yield you'll get on the bond or what we call the market rate of interest is above the coupon rate of the bond and you can think of this as being because you're getting the coupons over time but you're also getting a capital gain you're paying less for less than a thousand pounds for that bond now where you're going to get a thousand pounds back when the bond matures so you get the interest and you get a bit more when you buy the bond at a discount to its par value cheaper than its par value so a five percent coupon bond with a par value of a thousand pounds if you could buy that bond for less than a thousand pounds you'd be getting a yield or a market rate of interest on the bond which was more than five percent which was more than its coupon rate great and and if you want to say the same thing sort of the other way around if investors become if investors become less keen to hold that bond because I know they think there's a risk that uh, interest rates in general are going to be rising because of inflation or if it is the Greek government bond they think there's default risk then under those circumstances they'll be looking for a higher market rate of interest or yield on the bond and that means they'll be prepared to pay a lower price for the bond now in order to buy it. On the other hand, if you have to pay a price for the bond if you want to buy it, which is above its par value, because there's such demand for the bond and limited supply, everybody wants to buy the bond, maybe because this is an ultra safe monetary sovereign government bond and everything else seems very dodgy at the moment, or perhaps because you think interest rates are going to fall a long way and so you're very attracted to buy this 10-year government bond. If you pay a price for this bond which is above £1,000, then the market rate of interest or the yield you'll get if you hold the bond until it matures will be a bit less than 5%. Because although you're getting those coupons over time, the coupon interest payments, you're, you're making a bit of a capital loss on the bond. You're paying more than £1,000 for something, which when it matures, the government will only give you £1,000 for um, at the end of the loan of the bond. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. So I'm just going to quote a, a, a couple of sentences from Bill's recent piece, Bill Mitchell's recent piece. Uh, um, and we we'll just ignore the numbers for a second. And I'll, uh, I just wanted to ask you about the principle behind this. Um, so here's the quote. Imagine that the market wanted a yield of 6% to accommodate risk expectations. And he's talking about a 5% mm -hmm. coupon rate bond. So for them, the bond is unattractive to buy. And so they would put in a purchase bid exactly. lower than the thousand pounds, so thousand pounds, to to ensure they get the six percent exactly. return they sought. So, yeah, well, I really like that. But could you just talk about risk expectations? What does he mean when 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 he says, "Imagine the market wanted a yield of six percent; it can't get it because it's a five percent bond." Uh, to but to accommodate risk expectations okay uh, what does that uh, mean all right well you're forcing me to delve into things a bit more so we'll have a go actually if you buy those bonds which have got i don't know how many years to run 10 years to run there is an active secondary market in bonds in the uk all the big financial institutions are what's called gilt edge market makers which means for bonds which have been issued in the past they quote continuously prices at which they're prepared to buy and sell them so that there's a second hand market you don't have to hold bonds to maturity indeed the bond market is very deep there's very large scale transactions on the bond market and if we were talking about the market for u.s government bonds it's the deepest financial market in the world lots of buying and selling of them in other words, over time. So actually, when I buy, just to contradict what I said earlier, when I was oversimplifying a bit, if I buy um, UK government bonds that have got 10 years to run, I'm not necessarily tying my money up for 10 years. I could sell those bonds on the secondary market before they mature. However, 
if financial market conditions change, if market interest rates change, then um, the prices of bonds which have got longer until they mature uh, react more which I don't know whether that sort of makes sense. There's a mathematical reason for that, but it might make sense because basically I suppose you've got more interest payments. So if, if, if interest rates change, uh, it's going to have a bigger effect on the market. There's, uh, it's, it's more complicated than that, generally speaking. But um, it, if, if you had a government bond that's going to mature tomorrow and interest rates change today, it really doesn't have much effect on you. You're getting your cash back tomorrow. So it's not going to have any effect on the price of that bond on the secondary market today. If, on the other hand, you're trading on the secondary market today in a bond which doesn't mature for 10 or 15 or 20 years, then changes in interest rates have a bigger impact on bond prices on the secondary market. That makes those bonds, those longer dated bonds, more risky to hold. There's more price risk associated with them because if you wanted to sell them to get your cash back soon if interest rates change the prices of the bonds will change and specifically if interest if, if the market rate of interest goes up the prices of those longer term bonds will go down further so potentially you could make more of a loss as a result of unexpected changes in interest rates if you're investing in bonds which have got longer to maturity so those bonds are longer term bonds are more risky than the short term bonds. There's more price risk associated with them. That is the re reason we normally give for why um, yield curves on average historically have been upward sloping. In other words, uh, market rates of interest on 10 or 15 or 20 year bonds have been higher than market rates of interest on bonds with one year to run or than official interest rates because of that additional that additional risk. And when we talk about inverted yield curves, we're talking about that normal risk premium being more than wiped out by investors expecting that short-term interest rates are going to fall and being worried that if they only tie their money up now for a short period of time, when they come to reinvest their money in a year or two's time, they'll get a much lower return on it if meantime interest rates have fallen. So that makes them very keen to tie up their money over a longer period of time. And it means that risk premium I was talking about before disappears. They don't, they don't require it. Uh, and indeed, if expectations of falling short-term interest rates are strong enough, then those expectations can more than offset the normal risk premium on longer-term bonds, and that's where inverted yield curves come from. That's when long-term interest rates are below short-term interest <coughs> rates on the market. We're talking about market interest rates on bonds here. Otherwise, if we're talking about bonds in general, and right the way across the yield curve, and this might be what Bill was talking about, why would investors require a higher yield on bonds than they did before? Well, maybe because they're worried that inflation is going to be higher than they were before. If there's been an increase in inflationary expectations, then investors in general will be looking for a higher return to tie their money up in, in government bonds because they'll be looking to compensate themselves for the impact of uh, that expected inflation on what they can buy with their money. So um, forgive me if I'm putting this sloppily. Um, at the moment, a, an investor might think, right, when the economy's, when the economy's bad, the central banks, quote unquote, bad, the uh, central bank lowers interest rates that, you know, they think that is going to stimulate the economy. Uh, and and when it starts getting good, they get worried about inflation and they raise rates uh, because they think that's going to put the brakes on. Is that is that sound all right or too sloppy? We've got at least 30 years of uh, sort of established practice and uh, way of looking at the world where, yes, that is what people still think.
that's what they think. And obviously, MMTers are like, no, that's backwards. When you when you lower the rates, you are uh, removing interest income from the economy. It's not it's not lovely income. <laughs> it's not it's not the spending that people who are out of work need, <laughs> but it's, it removes interest income from the economy. And uh, when you and when you raise rates, you put it back in. Yeah, well, that's the fiscal impact of uh, of changes in interest rates on government debt, which is particularly powerful when there is a lot of government debt. Not so powerful in countries where there isn't as much government debt, like in Australia. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. However, there are lots of ways in which changes in interest rates can have an impact on financial markets and the economy. And the short run impact of a change in interest rates depends really on the state of balance sheets. It depends on how much private debt and how much household debt there is at the moment, uh, whether it's the case that lower interest rates might push up the property market and lead to more mortgage borrowing. Um, um, but where you've got a lot of uh, household debt, then interest rate cuts are, are not going to stimulate all that much of uh, – um, uh, households just don't want to borrow anymore. They don't want to get further into debt. And businesses might not be as indebted as households. At least that's the case in Australia right now. But there's no reason for businesses to engage in more investment just because interest rates are lower. Businesses will invest more when they expect to sell more. Um, interest rate cuts have distributional effects on the economy. If you if you do have a big mortgage, then when interest rates come down, you've got more disposable income, you might spend more. On the other hand, there's people like me who are old and don't have a mortgage anymore. And when interest rates fall, we get less of a return on our term deposit. So maybe we'll spend less and that can, that can cancel out. There might be a net positive effect on spending from that. Lower interest rates can sometimes... Uh, when one country is cutting its interest rates and another one's expected to put interest rates up, can sometimes reduce uh, uh, the value of your currency on the foreign exchange market. And that can make your exporters a bit more price competitive. So that could boost demand in the economy through exports. So those are all, all factors that can have an influence on the impact of a change in interest rates on spending and on the economy in the short run. But in the long run, what Warren talks about is absolutely true, which is that in the long run, you're absolutely right, particularly where there are high levels of government debt, the dominant impact of lower interest rates will actually be um, to um, reduce the uh, uh, transfer from the government, from the public sector, the private sector and interest payments over time, which is deflationary, the opposite of what everybody talks about the whole time. And higher average interest rates works the other way. I mean, it, it's uh, effectively a sort of fiscal stimulus in the interest payments on government debt are mildly stimulative, only mildly yeah. stimulative uh, uh, for the economy over time. The safest thing to say about the impact of changes in interest rates on the economy is that it can go either way. Monetary policy is weak. And it can sometimes have a perverse effect. And I'd missed out something at the moment, which is that interest rate when we're so close to zero already, or we've got negative interest rates in, in some countries. Uh, under these circumstances, interest rate cuts can appear to be panic driven. And that has an informational impact on people. It can make people think that the economy is in an even worse state than they thought it was before. And that's hardly going to encourage businesses to invest more or consumers to spend more. Just an aside. Well, yeah, I mean, you just said it that, um, you know, we're, we're close to zero interest rates anyway. And it seems to me looking around that even mainstream economists are saying, uh, yeah, the uh, monetary policy has gone as far as it can go. Fiscal policy. Absolutely. I interviewed a very well-known uh, mainstream economist, uh, financial economist in the city. She's on Bloomberg News often, uh, Lena Komileva, who, although uh, she respects uh, MMT, she's not an MMT 
economist. Uh, I absolutely love her. She was a student of mine 20 odd years ago, but she is a mainstream economist. I interviewed her via not Skype, but Zoom uh, with one of my classes at the university only three or four hours ago. Uh, and that's exactly what she said. I mean, she substantially now agrees with us about these issues. So yes, the mainstream are coming round, the sensible mainstream economists are coming round to our view. And for example, she was talking about, and I think she's written something about this somewhere recently, um, she was talking about Germany at the moment with the German economy being in recession. And uh, although Germany is technically not a monetary sovereign, it obviously, I mean, it virtually a monetary sovereign, it has enormous scope to use fiscal policy to support the economy uh, if it wanted to, and that would benefit um, the whole world economy, certainly benefit the rest of the uh, Eurozone whether to do so. And she was talking to me about the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you land in Berlin and you thought, you think, hang on a minute, this is one of the richest countries in the world. Why can't they build a decent airport? Why don't they have decent mm-hmm. infrastructure? Right. Why are they not spending more? Uh, so, yeah, people like uh, Lena Komaleva certainly are fully on board with the notion that, uh, at least in many countries around the world, uh, we should be, or governments should be using fiscal policy to support the economy and push the economy towards or hold it close to um, full employment. Yeah, well, in a few weeks' time, I'm going to talk to uh, Kevin Muir, who's a uh, a, a finance writer, but he's also a trader uh, in Canada, and uh, he he actually on his blog recommended the interview I did with you last time mm. uh, because he wrote a look a trader's guide to MMT, and he he was saying, look, we have to deal with what really is. So let's just if you can bear with me and not be you know hyperbolic about mmt for a second let me explain to you what i think they're talking about <laughs> and and he, you know he's going look whether we like it or not and I, I, he's going mmt is coming <laughs> now to me when i if i ever say mmt is coming i mean i i would mean maybe they will maybe uh, public opinion will see the light and think the job guarantee is a good idea. <laughs> the, you know, to me, that's the only bit of MMT that we don't have. Everything else is a description. Yeah, well, it depends what you mean. Uh, uh, when you say MMT is coming, it's okay to say that if you mean the people that are making decisions are going to use MMT as a frame. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's probably what he means. Actually, I don't have it in front of me, so apologies if I'm uh, misrepresenting him. But I think that's what I took to mean when when he was uh, uh, when I read it, and uh, and and I think that is what's happening slowly but surely. Even the even the sort of MMT haters in the mainstream will say all this stuff about money printing, and, and then but then they will substantially agree with MMT. Or the or the MMT economists like you and Stephanie and everybody else we could name that the um, the monetary policy is it's a blunt tool it's not working. You can go a bit further than that. You can say I think this is true. Every time historically the monetary policy has taken the lead, um, it has been associated with asset price bubbles, um, private indebtedness, and rising inequality. And when we have had an approach to macroeconomics, which has been based on something similar to functional finance or an MMT perspective, um, then we've had full employment and economies have grown, but we've had, we've avoided those big financial crises. We've avoided the asset price bubbles. We've kept a lid on the behaviour of private financial institutions, and we've seen more equality, less inequality. That's what happened, obviously, under very different circumstances, and there were not people, people were not, the people in charge didn't have, I would argue, the same understanding of the financial system and the monetary system that their contemporaries um, like Hyman Minsky or Paul Davidson from the post-Keynesian school would have had. But 
during the 1950s and 60s and even early 70s, um, policy decisions were much nearer, even though it's the fixed exchange rate world in those days, so there was less there was less fiscal space for governments, but policy decisions were much nearer um, what you and I would like to see than they have been since. Since that all broke down in the 1980s, since the neoliberals took over and since uh, since we had uh, um, initially monetarists um, claiming they were trying to control the money supply and then when they gave that up, still talking about a natural rate of unemployment or Nairu and inflation targets and uh, depoliticized interest rate decisions. We've had financial instability, wealth inequality, income inequality. There are lots of reasons um, for going back to fiscal dominance and, and it's really important that progressive economists and politicians next time we do it really do understand the the basis for it and so i think it's important that we don't sort of as a panic measure go back to uh, um, fiscal dominance but have people like paul krugman um, explaining why and talking about liquidity traps and uh, all the nonsense that we get out of him and the idea that at some point we'll be able to go back again to having central banks uh, um, take the lead with uh, um, um, interest rate decisions and uh, then being responsible for hitting inflation targets and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, the general deficit dove position. Yeah, when when people like Larry Summers and Paul Krugman, I it seems very cheeky me talking about a former US Treasury Secretary in a Nobel Prize winner like this, but when they get it right, they get it right by accident. It's not a real Nobel Prize. Let's just, I, I have to say, I have to say that every time. Absol- absolutely. Yeah. And uh, 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 shame to say they've given about a hundred of them, only one to a woman. So far, I could think of at least two women that I'd like to give a prize. Uh, and well, not just them two, uh, Bill Mitchell and Warren Mosler and and uh, uh, Randall Ray, but yes, yeah, Stephanie Kelton and Pavlina Cherneva, they'd be up there towards the top of the list if we had a proper Nobel Prize, as far as I'm concerned. But um, uh, like I said, those guys, they occasionally, and I think Stephanie, in a recent article that she wrote about her debate with Paul Krugman, made this point, they occasionally agree with us as far as policy is concerned, but they never really understand why. And as far as I'm concerned, they, they, they sometimes get the right, uh, the right answer by accident. The great thing about modern monetary theory is that it is based on a realistic description of the monetary system and how it actually works and uh, how the economy evolved over time as a set of interlocking balance sheets that always has the potential to evolve in ways which are liable to uh, lead to financial fragility and instability, particularly if you rely on, rely on private debt for the purpose. And the sectoral balances stuff from from Wynne Godley, which is part of modern monetary theory now, all that's so important. Yeah, I always think that the the mainstream, uh, they, you know, it's that they're, they're like stop clocks, uh, right twice a day. And it's almost like the, the state of mainstream economics is the way medicine was back when we were sticking leeches on things. You know, sometimes things would get better and we'd be like, oh yeah, the leeches work. I no longer call it mainstream economics. And the reason for that is I think that we are on the brink of winning. Right. I think within 18, I might be wrong. And of course, the one of the founders, if you had to pick one person, the founder of MMT, Warren Mosler, um, thought he, that everybody would uh, um, understand MMT 20 odd years ago. And they didn't. It's taken a long time. But we are so close to zero and negative interest rates virtually everywhere. We're so close to everyone. Central bankers now are starting to say to governments, hang on, we just can't do this on our own. We're so close to everybody understanding that the so-called New Keynesian, or if you want to call it neoclassical, you can, or orthodox, or formally mainstream, 
approach to macroeconomics is wrong. It's misleading and it's wrong. Um, we're so close to that being obvious that I think, uh, just like with Bill uh, and Randy and Martin Watts' textbook just being called macroeconomics now, yeah, uh, they didn't call it modern monetary theory, I don't really want to call their approach to macroeconomics mainstream anymore because to me it isn't mainstream. We are mainstream. That was the MMT Podcast with Patricia Pino and Christian Riley. Don't forget, you can support the show through Patreon, starting at a dollar a month, and get access to patron-only episodes where we answer your specific questions. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash mmtpodcast. You can also find me on Twitter at mmtpodcast, and you can find Patricia on Twitter at Patricia N. Pino. And you can email us at mmtpodcast at outlook.com. Thanks for listening, and we hope to hear from you.